It is difficult to imagine a 16-year-old girl leaving home to go fight for her country. Even more difficult to imagine is the same innocent young girl leading an army, of, an army into battle and crowning the new king and being put to death before her 20th birthday. Although it is almost impossible to believe, this is the true story of Joan of Arc. This is a picture of Joan of Arc in her army, or in her, um, armor. <laughs> and this is another depiction of Joan. My fascination with this incredible tale has led me to do thorough research, consulting the works of authors and historians, including Deanna Proach, who is a freelance writer and blogger, Mary Gordon, who is a professor of English at Bernard College of Columbia University, and Regine Pernude, who was not only a pioneer women's historian, but also a member of the French Academy and a founder of the Centre Jeanne d'Arc in Orleans, France. Joan helped renew the strength of the French resistance against the English during the 100 Years' War in the 14th century. Today I'm going to tell you about this remarkable young girl who heard heavenly voices which compelled her to leave her home, lead an army of men into battle against the English, and crown the Dauphin, Charles VII. Let us start by examining the voices which led Joan in her bravado. <clears throat> According to Mary Gordon's book titled Joan of Arc, Joan first started hearing her voices in 1424 when she was just 12 years old. At first, the voices were telling her to preserve her virginity in order to stay pure in the eyes of the Lord, and later they became more specific. She was told to crown the Dauphin king and save France from the English. Just to clarify, the Dauphin is the eldest son of a king. Joan of Arc firmly believed that these voices were the word of God and she was to obey them. Now that I've explained the importance of Joan's voices, let's look at jo Joan's role in crowning the Dauphin. In Joan of Arc, the Maid of Orleans, Deanna Proch writes, Led by her divine voices, Joan traveled to Vaucouleurs and asked the local commander, Robert de Baudicourt, for permission to send her across English-held territory to see the Dauphin in Chignon. At first he thought her to be crazy and sent her away. But later, she returned with the respect of the townspeople, and he agreed <clears throat> to let her travel to Chignon and gave her six knights to accompany her. When Joan arrived in Chignon with her men, she asked to be received by the Dauphin, but he decided to trick her. In his book, Joan of Arc by Herself and Her Witnesses, Regine Pernude cites an excerpt of Jean Chartier's Chronique. Then Joan, who was come before the king, made the bows and reverences customary, and said, God give you life, gentle king, whereas she knew him not and had never seen him. He answered her, Not I am the king, Joan, and pointing to one of his lords, said, There is the king. To which she replied, By God, gentle prince, it is you and none other. In her article, Proch says that Joan's success in identifying the king was interpreted as divine confirmation of his legitimacy to the throne, which had previously been called into question. Shortly after the Battle of Orleans, which I will get to in a moment, Joan of Arc and her men traveled to Reims so that Joan could see to it that um, Charles be crowned. Charles was re resistant to Joan's efforts, mainly because of his um, concern over his legitimacy. But she went ahead and announced the coronation anyway, and with Joan by his side, he was crowned king. Now let me tell you about the Battle of Orleans, which was Joan's most amazing success. <clears throat> After Joan met the Dauphin, he gave her permission to take her men to Orleans, which had been under siege by the English for six months. Orleans was basically a port city located on the northern bank of the Loire River. It was also heavily fortified by a great wall and barred gates. The French were basically trapped in their city. Dunois, the bastard of Orleans, convinced Joan to accompany some provisions into Orleans, but the wind prevented the boats from moving downstream. Joan then told Dunois not to worry about the wind, and as soon as she said this, the wind changed direction. Gordon believes this to be one of Joan's most important miracles. 
According to her book, it was on May 4th that Joan led her first victorious battle against the English. On May 7th, she was injured when an arrow pierced her body just above her left breast. After her wound was dressed, she rejoined the fighting, and upon seeing their wounded heroine with them again, the soldiers reacted with great enthusiasm, and they were again victorious. The English lifted the siege on May 8th. Joan of Arc had saved Orleans, and she was then on known as the Maid of Orleans. Let me end by saying, Joan of Arc heard voices which she believed to be from God, which compelled her to leave home at a young age and crown the Dauphin, Charles VII, and lead her men to victory against the English at Orleans. She was the pious young peasant girl that helped renew the strength of the French resistance against the English during the Hundred Years' War in the 14th century. There is no one else like her in history.